Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Fallbrook Climate Action Team uh, community presentation tonight. We are a group of citizen volunteers, and none of us get paid. We just do this because we really care about the climate and want to try to put change into action. So we bring you presentations on the last Tuesday of every month. And um, we are excited tonight to have Jonathan Cole, who is a professor of physics at Mira Costa. Is that correct, John? I got um, that right? Actually recently retired, but still teaching oh. climate. Okay, very good, very good. Well, we're in good hands here because um, we definitely uh, need to hear about the hot spots and the information that Jonathan's going to be talking to us tonight about. So. With that, um, I'd just like to remind everyone a couple of things. First off, if you haven't ventured onto our website, check that out. It's FallbrookClimateActionTeam.org. And you can see uh, links to various resources as well as past video presentations that we've had. So check that out if you haven't been on there. And then for tonight's presentation, just a reminder, we're gonna keep the, the everyone muted until the end. Um, to allow Jonathan just to get through his information. But if you come up with a question that you want to remember or want to put it in the chat, just scroll down to the bottom with your cursor and you'll see the chat function pop up. Click on that, it'll open a sidebar window and you can type your question in there and that'll preserve it till later. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll go ahead and go through those questions as well as open up the line and allow everybody to um, ask questions with Jonathan. So with that, Jonathan, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Terry. I'm uh, basic, as, as we said, I uh, taught physics at uh, Miracosta College for about 36 years. I retired right at the beginning of COVID. And uh, I uh, have since then, I'm, I also developed a climate class, which I taught for about 10 years. And I have uh, in retirement been focusing really on uh, research as well as uh, a bit of teaching. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, climate hotspots, as as we mentioned. But uh, first, I wanted to uh, start with a uh, shameless plug. So uh, I am teaching uh, my cl the climate course again in the fall. This is an online course. If you're interested, it's a 108H, which means it's an honors course, but you don't have to be part of you know, the Maricosta Honors Program. Uh, it will the, it will meet once a week synchronous, meaning everybody meeting together for discussions on Tuesday mornings, 9 to 10, 15. And then uh, the rest of the activities are online. And this includes a curriculum called Bending the Curve that has uh, video talks from a variety of researchers, mostly from the University of California. And uh, so it's, it's a really, it's a solutions oriented course. Uh, we usually have really good discussions so, um, you know, if you're interested or know anybody you think might be interested, pass it on. Uh, you can uh, register at the college, or you, if you have questions, you can email me, and my email, jcole at miracos.edu, is at the bottom of the screen there. So uh, that's the, 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 the basics of the course. And the course, the, the UC portion of this was actually spearheaded by a climate researcher at Scripps, whose name is uh, Virabhadran Ramanathan, which is kind of a mouthful, so everybody just calls him Ram. And uh, Ram, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with Ram in a couple, on a few different projects. Uh, I co-wrote two chapters in a textbook for the course with him, and uh, I am currently doing some research with him. And we're looking, as we said, at climate hotspots. And there's different ways you can define climate hotspots. Uh, we've been thinking of them, especially in terms of drought. And so, for example, this is a bulletin we put out last year looking at California as a regional hotspot. But uh, for this lecture, especially as I was putting things together, and especially with what's in the news, it really seems like the hotspots that we're interested in right now are uh, really related to the heat waves that are going on. So I wanted to talk about heat waves and give a little bit of perspective there. And um, so the title is slightly changed and I apologize in advance for the title. Uh, it's not just the heat. And uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, the, the uh, heat waves in terms of both heat 
and humidity here. So of course, that's the, the punchline, uh, literally in this case. Uh, usually, I want to slap the people who say it's not the heat, it's the humidity, because uh, part of it, humidity makes me crabby. A lot of us are, are not great with humidity. But humidity can really make heat feel much more oppressive. And we've been experiencing pretty oppressive heat uh, in different parts. Fortunately, not here. We've, we're so fortunate in California that uh, we have not experienced this. But across the U.S., we've seen uh, major heat waves last week, uh, different types of alerts and so on. Uh, we have in California, we've been this year compared to the last couple of years, the fire season didn't start as early, but we have now seen uh, the Oak Creek fire near Yosemite. Fortunately, it seems to be slowing down, but uh, we're just at the beginning. And again, as people say, we don't really have fire season anymore. We can get fires year round because of increasing temperature, dryness, and so on. These uh, heat waves have a lot of impacts. I'm going to be focusing on human health impacts in this talk, but of course there's uh, impacts on crops, on cattle, and especially on natural ecosystems. Uh, so I'm not talking about that, but please be aware that that's another major piece. This uh, stress on herds, this, uh, this latest heat wave has stressed herds. A month ago, a heat wave in Kansas uh, caused the deaths of thousands of cattle. So this has been an ongoing issue. And of course, now the heat wave is dying out in the east. But now the Northwest is again getting a heat wave. We had a heat wave in the Northwest about a year ago. Portland had temperatures 100, uh, well above 100 degrees. And there's another major heat wave uh, starting now. Uh, Portland hit uh, very close to 100 today, if not 100. There's uh, some of the inland cities like Yakima are going to be looking at temperatures above 110 in the next few days, which is something we just never heard about in, in uh, previous decades. It's not just the US. So uh, there's also major heat waves going on. We had a major heat wave in India and Pakistan last month. There's a heat wave in China. And I want to show just a short video to give a flavor of how broad the impacts of these are. Uh, hopefully we've worked out the video issues, but please let me know in the chat window if you're not able to hear the video. Dozens of cities have been experiencing record high temperatures. Last week, more than 80 cities issued red alerts, with some locking temperatures of more than 110 degrees Fahrenheit. In central China, a museum closed after the roof melted. In Nanjing, the city opened underground air raid shelters for people to escape the heat. Meanwhile, crops are withering and dying under the high temperatures. The soil parched and cracked. The damage to China's crop production threatens to push up inflation, putting more pressure on an economy already devastated by the pandemic. So we've got heat, we've got health impacts, we've got economic impacts. Uh, these heat waves just hit, hit us in a very wide variety of sectors. And of course, the heat wave that probably got the most news in the uh, last year was the heat wave in the UK. This was an un, uh, unusual heat wave. They uh, hit a temperature of 40 Celsius. That's about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. First time they've recorded temperatures above 40 Celsius in England. And this is a big deal for, for England because they're just not prepared for these kinds of temperatures. They haven't really lived with those. The infrastructure is not set up for it. The houses are designed to retain heat during the cold winter not to uh, keep the houses cool. And of course, very few, uh, relatively few people compared to the US have air conditioning. Infrastructure has been affected. Uh, that These kinds of temperatures that haven't been experienced before can cause rails to buckle. So tr the train system nationwide in uh, the UK slowed down in order to uh, deal with the extreme heat. The Hammersmith Bridge over the Thames, they actually wrapped it in foil because uh, the expansion due to the heat, the jo expansion joints just weren't set up for this uh, degree of temperature. And so they wrapped it in foil to keep it from overheating. So lots of effects on infrastructure. And uh, just yesterday, there was a uh, significant uh, fire 
uh, that uh, basically destroyed several houses. And uh, this is in not somewhere out in, in the country, in, deep in the countryside. This is actually, this is uh, what we call the wildland urban interface. People are starting to talk about the WUI, the wildland urban interface. And in California with wildfires, this is a big issue. So we can see this area, Wennington is right at the edge of London, but it's where London kind of meets the countryside. So wildfires can encroach. And uh, so we've got uh, wildfire damage. We may see more wildfires in the next few weeks, uh, crops affected by drought and so on. So this is a, a pretty significant issue. On the other hand, a uh, little pet peeve of mine is uh, often these heat waves get covered as if, oh, look, it's nice hot weather. And uh, we can see an example of this from uh, the Sunday Times, which tends to be a little climate skeptical. So it's, oh, people enjoying the hot weather in Brighton. Wasn't this fun? And this is not just, of course, in Britain. We see this in the US too. You get the uh, pictures of you know kids playing in fountains. Even with really kind of grim headlines, you've got people in, in the fountains. So you look at the pictures and it kind of looks like fun, but the reality is pretty grim. And sometimes uh, there are folks who really are trying to minimize the heat as a way of countering climate talk. And there was an especially egregious example of this on British TV last week. This was before the heat wave hit. So this was a meteorologist making predictions about the severity of this heat wave that was coming in. The day he was talking to uh, the anchor person, he was, uh, the temperatures were about 20 Celsius, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit, very nice. But of course the predictions were for 40 Celsius, 104 degrees. But it's interesting to see the reaction of the anchor here. Oh, you see, John, you're outside enjoying yeah. the sunshine. It's not too it's, hot, it's, is it? No, it's it's absolutely lovely. It's, what, 20 degrees out here? It's perfect. But um, on a serious note, folks, um, by early next week, you can scrap 20 degrees. It could well be 40 degrees. I think there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of excess deaths early next week. John. The charts that I can see in front of me are frightening. So we all like nice weather, but this will not be nice weather. This will be potentially lethal weather for a couple of days. It'll be brief, but it'll be brutal. Oh, so, John, you know, but... we can... We... Oh, oh, yeah. So, this is... So, John, I want us to be happy about the weather and every single... I don't know whether something's happened to meteorologists to make you all a little bit fatalistic and, and <laughs> harbingers of doom. Because all of the broadcasts, particularly on, on the BBC, every time I've turned on anyone's talking about the weather, they're saying that there's going to be tons of fatalities. But haven't we always had hot weather, John? I mean, wasn't the 76, the summer of 76, that was as hot as this, wasn't it? Uh, no. I'm just going to cut it off there, but uh, you get the sense. Uh, this is a, a channel that tends to be somewhat skeptical about uh, climate change. And uh, again, the, the minimizing, you can kind of see the meteorologist at some point, he's kind of working his jaw because he's not at all happy about this. Uh, but this is, is the kind of thing that, that people will, you'll sometimes hear these arguments to minimize, oh, it's all, we always have hot weather. So uh, this is just a, uh, another climate scientist put together a, uh, these uh, images. This was June 76. There was a serious heat wave in Europe and in England. And uh, by the way, he talked about excess deaths, deaths above what you would normally expect for that time of year. There were about 700 excess deaths from this heat wave. We don't know yet what the toll is from the most recent heat wave. Uh, probably it's going to be uh, in the order of many hundreds of people. But hopefully people got the warnings, uh, got to cooling shelters, but uh, we still will expect some excess deaths. So this was June 1976. It was hot in Europe and Britain, but we can see that a lot of the, the world was colder. And we're measuring this in terms of what's called the temperature anomaly, which means how the temperature compares to some base period, usually sometime in the 20th century. So here the base is 1951 to 1980. So compared to the middle of the 20th century, some regions were noticeably hotter, some were cooler. So that's the, the uh, plot for 1976. 
if we look at just last month, June 2022, we see this is a very different situation. We do have a big heat wave over Europe, North Africa, but notice that almost all of the world is warmer than the average for the uh, 21st century. So this is a heat wave happening in the context of a warming world. One little side note here, you notice there is a big patch of blue cooler temperatures in the uh, Pacific off the coast of Peru. And this is because we've got uh, what's called a La Nina going on. La Ninas have a lot of consequences. One is to make uh, California tends to be drier during La Nina, Southern California, but it also means we have cool surface water. So uh, that cool surface water adds a, a little cool patch on the surface, but most of the world is quite warm. So if we look, so temperatures are a major factor. Temperatures are the big driving factor in heat waves. So let's talk a little bit more about the heat, meaning talking about temperatures. There's a lot of different ways that climate scientists look at temperature differences, temperature anomalies. So uh, these are temperature anomalies. In this case, it's relative to 1910 to 2010. So covering most of the 20th century. And again, red years are warmer than the average, blue years are cooler. And it really stands out on this graph. This is a worldwide average surface temperature, land and ocean. So just one average for the whole planet for each year. And it's pretty easy to see that progress in warming and this green line shows a kind of a smooth trend. And we can see that especially since the 1980s, the temperatures have just been going up and up and up. And of course, it's well established that the reason for this is the greenhouse gases that we're adding to the atmosphere. There's really no scientific debate about that at this point. It's very well documented, very well understood. So this, again, the heat waves are happening against this background of rising temperatures which is making them much more severe than they used to be in the past. One question you might ask with this really hot summer, is this gonna be the hottest year on record? And it's, it doesn't look like it. Uh, we don't of course have the full year, but we can look at the first half of the year. So uh, this next graph is the same kind of graph, but instead of looking at the whole year, it looks only at January through June. And that way we can include 2022 because we've got data for that. And what we can see is 2022 is hot, quite a bit hotter than most years, but it's not the hottest year on record. Right now, it looks like it's about number six in, in the record. It'll almost certainly end up in the top 10, maybe in the top five by the end of this year, but uh, it's not a record breaker. So we're seeing that what's a normal year now is much hotter than what a typical year was in the past. And so uh, this is the context that's making heat waves warmer. There's another way we can look at this instead of looking at a single number for the whole planet, we can look at how this has uh, progressed over time. So this is an animation, NASA updates this animation every year. And what we're seeing here is a five-year average of the temperature in each place. Here, they're comparing to a 1951-1980 baseline, so compared to the mid-20th century. Blue is cooler than the mid-20th century average. Yellows and reds are warmer. And this is a five-year average over the period 1880 to 1884. And what we'll do then is click forward one year at a time, eat a five-year period starting in 1880, uh, now 1908, 1911, and so on. And we can see the temperatures kind of fluctuating back and forth, some warmer periods in the 30s and 40s, then a little bit uh, cooler again. But once we start moving into the 1980s, we can see a very different pattern. And again, this goes along with the graphs that we just saw for temperature anomalies. And this is showing the planet getting much, much warmer over that period. So we see the increasing temperature. We also see that it's not evenly distributed. In particular, the Arctic, Siberia, those northern regions are warming much faster than the rest of the planet. And uh, that's um, because this is called Arctic amplification. One of the main reasons is because as ice melts up in the Arctic Ocean, 
that exposes darker seawater below. The darker seawater can absorb the heat more effectively. So this Arctic amplification is something we'll come back to this. I wanna, I'm gonna uh, mention this again in a little bit. So kind of keep that in mind. Again, we know why this is happening, increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And we've known this for, for quite a long time. I started looking at climate change in the early 1990s and I'd been looking at things like, this was a cover story in Newsweek in 1988. And in 1988, it was already understood that it was the human enhanced greenhouse effect. There was a, some more debate. There was certainly some debate about how bad it would get, but it was understood that this was going to cause increasing temperatures. And this was an article showing a family sweating after a really hot summer. The summers of 1987 and 1988 were very hot by the standards of that time. And of course, I say danger, more hot summers ahead. And we can see that that prediction certainly was uh, borne out. This is, uh, slightly, again, it's an, uh, this graph we saw the annual average. We saw January through June. This is looking only at summers, June through August. So this is saying, what did the summer, what did the summers look like over the past about 120 years, 140 years? So 1988 on this graph is right here. And you can see 1988 and just before it, 1987, those were the hottest summers anybody had experienced up to that time. So if you go back into the past, you, you just don't see a summer as hot as that. So people were concerned. They were freaked out about how hot the summer was. But if we compare this to the later summers, we can see that what was a very worryingly hot summer in 1988 would be considered a cool summer now. The global temperatures are much higher now. So we really are looking at a whole different context for these warming temperatures. There's one more way that we can look at this, and I want to do this because we're talking about heat extremes. So here again, we're looking at uh, just one temperature number average for the whole summer. What if we look at how those temperatures were distributed? And uh, this is uh, NASA scientist Jim Hansen supplied the data. The New York Times put together this nice graphic of it. And this is showing the distribution of temperatures. And the idea here is that the, along the horizontal, we're going from cold to hot as we go from left to right. And the vertical is how frequently that happened, how many days we had that were at a particular temperature. And so we've got a few extremely cold days, uh, more and more cold days. There's a range that's called normal, that's normal for the mid 20th century which is uh, the most frequent type of uh, weather than hot. And way over on the left, we've got this little small number, a tiny number of extremely hot days. Folks who've had statistics know this, this shape. It's called a bell curve or a Gaussian distribution. It's the kind of shape that you see when you've got uh, sort of random fluctuations around some average. So we've got these uh, weather fluctuations around an average temperature. So now let's see what happens to these, the statistics of the weather as we go forward in time. So we look at the 80s, the 90s, and then 2005 to 2015. Remember before ex the, those days that were classified as extremely hot, it was just a tiny number. There, was hard, there were a very small number. Now we've got far more extremely hot days than we had in the past. In fact, what is now a normal day, the most common day, is what would have been considered a hot day in the uh, mid 20th century. So we can see the statistics have really shifted. And the important idea here, that whole shift uh, of that center line is about one degree Fahrenheit, roughly, something on that order. Just a one degree shift in Fahrenheit means that the extremely hot days are many, are much, much more common. We're seeing them much more often. So a small shift in temperature, people sometimes say, oh, it's just a couple of degrees, why should we care? Well, it shifts the whole statistics. One other thing you might notice if, you, if you're looking closely is that not only did it shift over, but it's also squashed. The distribution's kind of squashed down, so the peak isn't as high and it spreads out further. So we have a wider tail of extremely hot days. 
We also have a wider tail of extremely cold days. So you can see you get a few days that are really very cold. This is because as you put more energy in the climate system, all the processes ramp up. And so differences between heat and cold can also ramp up. But on the average, we're warmer than we were. So again, some people point at the cold days and say, oh, look, we had a really, really cold day. How can the earth be warming? It's because of this. This is how the statistics are, are showing us what's happening to the weather. So temperature is telling us that the Earth's temperature is getting warmer, it's getting more variable, and so we're getting lots more extremely hot days than we had before. So that's the heat. Let's talk a little bit about the humidity. What's the effect of the increasing humidity? And of course, when we think of humidity, we think of perspiration. This is how we control our body temperature. We control our body temperature by perspiring. Basically, our body pumps moisture through our pores to the surface of our skin where it evaporates. It takes energy to turn that liquid water into a gas. So it takes that energy from our skin as the water evaporates. In other words, it's transferring heat off of our skin into the air. So it helps to cool us off. So sweating is very important. If we can't cool down enough by sweating, we can get into some very serious situations, like this woman at a cooling center in uh, Portland uh, last year when the temperatures got so high. Basically, if our core temperature gets too hot, all of our functions, all the biological, biochemical processes that drive us start to go a little haywire. And in the in mild cases, we get heat exhaustion. Symptoms include dizziness, thirst, we're just sweating profusely, you can have nausea and weakness, but this can lead to heat stroke. And heat stroke is basically where you just cannot cool down the core. Uh, it affects your brain function, so you can have confusion and dizziness, you can pass out, uh, and you may stop sweating because you basically sweat out all the moisture you can. So if somebody who's having a heat stroke, you really wanna get emergency services there as quickly as possible, cool them off with cold water or ice. Heat stroke is a very, very dangerous situation. And of course, our ability to cool ourselves through sweating depends on the humidity. We call it the relative humidity. What's the fraction of the total maximum of moisture that the air can hold? What fraction of that total maximum is the air holding right now? As we get to higher and higher humidities, 80, 90% humidity, it's harder to push that, it's harder to get the sweat to evaporate off of our body because the atmosphere is already loaded with, uh, with moisture. So uh, it's harder for us to cool off. It could also, of course, be harder if something blocks that evaporation. And to get, just get a sense of this, uh, this is the same video that a uh, little from another part of the same report on China that we saw earlier. One of the problems in China is that even in this hot weather, they're still requiring citizens to get COVID testing because of their very strict COVID policies. People are having to line up outside, but especially the people who are giving the tests have to wear protective gear, their personal protective uh, equipment, and they can't take it off. And it is not at all porous. Well, dramatic viral video out of China showing COVID testers getting physically sick, some even fainting from possible heat stroke. They've had to work long hours outdoors in those heavy protective suits. It's a scene playing out across China. Fainting, falling, crumpling on the ground, lying motionless, struggling to breathe. <laughs> the COVID workers' long hours in the suffocating heat made worse by their head-to-toe full-body protective gear. That is not water, according to state media. It's sweat gushing out of this worker's hazmat suit. The sweat pools inside the protective gear, lining the inside of their rubber gloves. The surging temperatures coinciding with surging COVID cases. To survive, COVID workers are getting creative, hugging giant blocks of ice, placing them on their backs, laps, and feet. Colleagues rub ice on each other and tape ice-cold water bottles to themselves. So this is an extreme case. This is, in this case, it's not that the humidity is so high they can't sweat. It's because they, this protective gear is preventing that moisture from evaporating. But this is the kind of situation you can get to 
if the temperature gets so warm and the humidity so high that you can no longer keep your body cool. So there's different ways we can measure this effect of heat and humidity. One that a lot of us are familiar with now is what they sometimes call the feels like temperature, which sort of what does it feel like uh, because of the humidity? But uh, the best way to measure this is to measure all the different factors that can uh, cause you to uh, heat up. Uh, one is temperature. The second big one is humidity, as we mentioned. Another is wind speed. If the, as the wind blows over you, it can take away some of that hot air. It can enhance the evaporation so that uh, that can cool you. And of course, your sun exposure. What the, what's the angle of the sun? How many clouds? And we can now start to measure these things. This used to be very expensive and difficult to measure. You'd have to have a large piece of apparatus. Now they have these handheld thermometers. Uh, that black globe measures uh, what's called the radiative heat, the energy coming in from the sun. There's a wet bulb thermometer that's measuring how effectively it can evaporate. There's a wind gauge built in. And this little handheld device takes all this into account and figures out what's called the wet bulb globe temperature. So wet bulb globe temperature is the, sort of the, the gold standard or the best way to measure the impacts of heat. And heat and humidity are the two biggest factors. This still isn't cheap. It's uh, actually, this model costs something like $500, but it's come down into a range where, for example, if you're running an athletic program, you can measure the wet bulb globe temperature, which is crucial if you're, say, having a football practice in August. You want to know what uh, conditions the uh, players are being exposed to. Uh, so that uh, this, for example, is a table of uh, wet bulb globe temperatures. And notice the wet bulb globe temperatures look kind of low. They're saying if it's over 92, we're in black uh, condition, which means we shouldn't be working out outdoors. Uh, well, you know, we've been talking about temperatures of 100, 110. But what it means when the wet bulb temperature is 92 is it says that's the coolest you can possibly cool yourself down to because of the humidity. So the outside temperature might be much higher. And uh, we're starting to, to look at this uh, more. And uh, this is uh, the Weather Service uh, uh, starting to talk about this. This is an experimental product at this point. It's not something that uh, people are, are uh, using regularly, but they're start the Weather Service is starting to experiment with forecasting this. So these are just regular temperatures. And this was yesterday's forecast for the afternoon today. So for example, if you look at uh, Yuma, you can see that uh, in the middle of the desert, or actually in the middle of the Imperial Valley, it's about 102. Uh, if we look at the wet bulb temperature for that, that's about 89. And so it's cooler because it says you could cool yourself down to 89, but 89 is still pretty hot. It's still uh, very dangerous. Uh, a lot of people, have, there, there's been a kind of a, a, a research that was done around 2010 argued that 95 was probably about the maximum wet bulb temperature that people could survive. And uh, by the way, this is a national map. And you can see in the upper left hand corner, the heat wave, all these black temperatures around uh, the uh, Oregon and Washington, where the heat wave is occurring. So this is a better measurement of potential heat stress. And again, there are arguments, though. Old research said 95. There's some new research just out this last month from Pennsylvania State where they did, did some actual experiments, got actual data with uh, students. And they're saying it's actually probably lower, maybe around 88. The idea being not if the, the wet bulb globe temperature is 88, you go outside and you fall over and die, but that you're at extreme risk of heat stroke, that you are at serious risk, especially if you exert yourself at all, of not being able to regulate your body temperature. So uh, wet bulb globe temperature is what uh, people are starting to look at. And there are a few places now where we are starting to hit those kinds of wet bulb globe temperatures of about 95. So for example, this is a city in Pakistan called uh, Jacobabad. And Jacobabad, Pakistan made the news because they hit a wet bulb temperature of 35 Celsius, which is 95 Fahrenheit. And again, just a little short video clip here to give a little bit of a sense. However, this particular video clip, the reporter came after the extreme heat. 
So he took it on a day when it was about 41 Celsius, about 105 degrees Fahrenheit was the outside temperature. Wet bulb temperature was probably in the mid 80s. So uh, the pe people you see are not at that extreme wet bulb temperature, but still in a very hot situation. Scientists say that Jacob Abad is at the forefront of climate change because according to scientific literature, it's only one of two places in the entire world which has crossed a very dangerous threshold. That threshold is measured on a scale, a temperature scale called the wet bulb scale. And that measures not just heat, but also humidity. Now, Jacob Abad is only one of two places which has crossed 35 on that scale. And that means that the body can no longer sweat enough to cool itself down. So that means that the temperature is more than the human body can withstand. Scientists are worried that as temperatures rise around the world and climate changes, then that sort of phenomenon will get worse. So that's wet bulb globe temperature. And again, this is a measure, a, a way of measuring the impact of both heat and humidity. And this is uh, a piece of the, the research that I've been doing. So again, these, these figures are very preliminary, um, you know, haven't been peer reviewed or vetted, but it gives an idea. Uh, this is a plot of temperature trend in the particular data set we're looking at has temperatures only for land. Uh, so I, uh, we only have land values here, but it also has humidity so we can put those together. So here's temperature trends. And again, you can see that rim along North Siberia, along the North of Alaska, where we have more warming from that Arctic amplification we talked about before. But if we mix this with the relative humidity trends, this is showing what's happening to relative humidity. And uh, relative humidity, most places is not changing that much. As the earth gets warmer, more, uh, more water evaporates from the oceans, and that keeps the relative humidity fairly stable, but different kinds of factors of atmospheric circulation, local geography, and so on can cause changes. So, for example, we can see over China um, and Western Europe and also the Northwest US, there are areas of decreasing relative humidity. There's big patches of increasing relative humidity in Canada and Siberia. I don't know for sure what's causing this. One possible explanation would be melting permafrost, releasing moisture into the air and causing the relative humidity to go up. But uh, that's uh, just speculation at this point. So we can combine these to get an estimate of what's happening with the wet bulb globe temperatures. And we see a graph that at first glance looks a lot like the uh, graph that we saw before. But one thing to notice is that now we're, we've got some additional hot spots especially uh, near the equator, so that uh, we've got a uh, we've got hot spots in the Amazon, for example, and in uh, the southern U.S. states around Texas, northern Mexico, and in the Middle East, which includes the region right somewhere around here where Jacobabad is. So we do see increasing. We do see increases in the, uh, this wet bulb globe temperature, which shows that the areas near the equator and in the Middle East are especially susceptible. So that's what we've been measuring. And these are all trends that we're measuring over the last 40 years. What's gonna happen in the future? What's the forecast for heat waves, future heat waves? And uh, if you follow this stuff, and I'm sure a lot of you folks have, have looked at a, a lot of these things, you see a lot of these graphs. This one looks kind of like the one that we were seeing before on steroids. Uh, this is a prediction, for example, of temperature. So this is looking at temperatures compared to the late 19th century average. The, this is from a report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, they're very they, they are basically the body that is, produces the most authoritative synthesis of what's going on. And we are looking at targets. Uh, you probably are aware that we're trying to keep warming well below two degrees Celsius, about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, and as close to one and a half degrees Celsius as possible. But 
if if we do not reduce our emissions, we could uh, end up looking at something more like four degrees Celsius, about seven degrees Fahrenheit of warming. So this is showing what the temperatures would look like. And we've seen a lot of graphs like this before. This one is a slightly different graph, although it doesn't look all that different. This is showing not warming compared to the 19th century, but how much warmer particular regions are gonna be at the maximum temperatures compared to the average temperatures. So this is really looking at how hot heat waves are gonna be. And the, the big takeaway here is just that as we get more global warming, it's not just that the planet gets warmer, but that the extremes are getting warmer even faster. So for example, the four degrees Celsius, that's about seven degrees Fahrenheit. If the world on average goes up by about seven degrees Fahrenheit, the extreme temperatures go up by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So the earth is going to get, as the earth warms, it's not just that it gets warm, but that the extremes get warm and the extremes are warming faster than the average temperatures are. So, you know, at this point, you know, we're, we're kind of sweating. We're, what are we going to do? How, 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 how do we deal with this? And of course, there are two ways we can respond. One is through adaptation, and we're going to need to do adaptation. There's no question that adaptation is going to be necessary. We're already seeing these high temperatures. Uh, and so these are just some I, suggestions. There's lots of others, um, obvious things that we need to do. One is that low-income communities and developing nations have less access to uh, resources like air conditioning, like cooling technologies. Their neighborhoods tend to be hotter, and there's lots of evidence that a lot of this is, for example, in the US, a history of, of redlining practices in real estate, so that uh, they tend, folks who are lower income tend to live in hotter neighborhoods or hotter areas and have fewer resources to deal with it. So we need to provide funding and cooling technology. We need to have cooling centers that are available and can open. And we're much better at this than we used to be. Uh, there was a heat wave in the 90s in Chicago that killed hundreds. There was a heat wave in France in 2003 that killed thousands. We don't see quite that level. There was something like 20,000 at least died. We don't see those levels because we're more aware now and people are more likely to go to, they're more likely to provide cooling centers we're more likely to go to those cooling centers. So it helps reduce deaths. Uh, design buildings so they can cool naturally uh, so that they don't get as hot. Change the urban areas, uh, this urban heat island effect that you've probably heard of that cities typically are 10, can be up to 10 degrees hotter than the surrounding countryside because of all the asphalt and dark surfaces. If you paint those light colors, or replace them with uh, lighter materials, that reduces the urban heat island effect. Uh, providing green spaces and shade trees so people have are protected from direct sun. And although this is hard for, for folks who are environmentally oriented to swallow, I find this it's difficult. We need more widespread air conditioning to help people survive those hottest times. But we need as much as possible to power this with energy that's low carbon emitting and also uh, many air conditioners, most air conditioner coolants right now are based on compounds called HFCs. And it was actually ROM back in the 1970s who made the first measurements to show that these kinds of cooling compounds are also really, really powerful greenhouse gases. So we need to phase those out. So this is adaptation, but a lot of this is, means we're inside more. We're, we're not out in nature. We're not in, out, you know, we want to be happy about the weather, as, as the uh, moderator said. Uh, we're not able to do that because of the heat waves. It's going to be very difficult to bring temperatures back down, but at least we can try to minimize the amount that they're going to go up in the future. And this is mitigation. So these are all the things that everybody in this group is very familiar with. So I'll just very quickly, we want to reduce CO2 emissions, phasing out fossil fuels, reducing deforestation, producing cement and steel with lower carbon emissions. Another major area which people are starting to talk about more, and again, Ram was one of the leaders in this, is reducing some of the other greenhouse gases, especially methane and HFCs. These don't stay in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide. So if you get rid of those, you actually get a temperature benefit very quickly. So we want to attack these super pollutants like methane and HFCs. 
And the last one is we want to find ways to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. This is a risky one because we don't really know how to do this at large scale yet. Hopefully, we will get better at this. Uh, the, one of the sort of low-hanging fruit uh, is adopting agricultural processes that restore soil carbon and uh, also uh, look at direct air capture of CO2. But direct air capture of CO2 is very, this, we're just starting with this technology, and it's not anywhere near the scale. It's at a tiny, tiny fraction of the scale we would need to really make a difference. And we're not sure if it's going to work at large scale or not. So we really need to lean on those first two before we, we look at the last solution. So just uh, trying to wrap up quickly, key takeaways. Uh, as we said, it's not just the heat, it's the humidity. So both temperature and humidity are things we have to look at. Heat waves are going to increase. They're going to be more frequent and more severe as the planet warms. We have to adapt in order to minimize death and suffering in future heat waves. But there's limits to how much we can adapt. So we really need to be rapidly reducing greenhouse gas emissions to avoid the most severe scenarios. And I know that seems difficult right now, especially with recent developments in Congress and the Supreme Court. but the temperature is not going to stop just because of uh, Congress or the Supreme Court. We need to continue educating people, talking to friends and neighbors, get increasing awareness of this. And that is the one hopeful piece of news is that the number of people who are concerned about climate change or in uh, the, the uh, Yale study Center for uh, Climate Communication has the two most concerned groups are alarmed and concerned for the first time there's more people in the alarmed group than any other group, which is the highest level of concern. So we need to keep talking, communicating with folks to mobilize some of this and try to, to get this to translate into uh, political reality. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks. And thanks so much for, for listening and sticking with me. And uh, questions? Oh, well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, why don't we go ahead and open up the lines? I don't see, um, uh, we got a couple comments in the chat. Wow, great presentation. Um, seems like the list of mitigations are the same as a decade ago. We are not making any progress. Um, yeah, the, the, the answer to that was we are making progress, but not enough, not fast enough. To, to really, if we want to stay below that two degrees Celsius, or hopefully the 1.5 degrees Celsius, that's going to be very, very difficult now. But the two degrees Celsius even is, is it's going to be difficult, but we are making progress. Uh, there are the, the, there's some, there's good news. The good news is a lot of it on the technology side and economic side that renewable energy is now incredibly cheap in the last, relative to what it used to be. Solar costs have come down about 90% in the last decade. We're now at the point where solar and wind are, it's cheaper to build new solar and wind plants than to keep the old fossil fuel plants going. The one issue, as everyone points out with renewables, is they're not, we can't control them. They're intermittent, so we can't control how much energy we get. We need to find energy storage, ways to smooth that out. But we've made a lot of progress in renewable energy, and the share of energy produced by renewables, though small, is growing very quickly. We've made huge uh, progress in auto electrification, and there really is a feel now that electric cars are on the, the verge of really taking off. Again, some issues with raw materials. Uh, there are certainly going to be supply demand issues trying to smooth all that out, but uh, we've had progress there too. And though if we can hit the electric production sector and the transportation sector, those are two major areas. What we need is incentives to ramp up this progress so it can happen fast enough. And so that's why it's extremely disappointing that uh, Congress, Senator Manchin uh, basically refused to support subsidies for electric cars, solar powers. Uh, we've tried to do regulation restriction. The Supreme Court's making that more difficult. So we really need to ramp up uh, the incentives, but that's having problems also. Um, I have uh, somebody said I have a mini split AC. Is that better? 
It is. I'm not sure how much. I have one too. I actually, I had an old gas fired furnace and no AC because I don't live that far from the beach. But now the last few years in September, October, there have been a few days where it, get, it just gets really miserably hot. Uh, I replaced my gas furnace with a, a mini split, which it's a heat pump that can act as a heater and air conditioner. It is more efficient, but I don't know the exact numbers and it's going to depend a lot on your particular unit. Um, let's see, do you see a role for nuclear energy in the future? This is really controversial, obviously, in uh, among folks who are you know tr tr looking for green transition. Nuclear energy is low carbon. It produces very little carbon dioxide. So I personally, I do think that there is a role for nuclear power, in at least in terms of keeping existing plants. I am much more skeptical about building new plants because it takes so long and it's so expensive to build a new plant. I think by the time you get a new, we're talking about decade scales and we see the costs of renewables going down and the cost of battery storage going down. So we may, by the time you build a nuclear plant, it may no longer be needed. But extending the life of existing plants is something we should look at very seriously. I think Germany now is regretting the decision and starting to mothball some of their nuclear plants because of uh, the issues with the war in Ukraine, gas being cut off. They're going to moving to burn coal, which is the worst fossil fuel for the environment. Uh, it would be nice if uh, if we had that nuclear as a cushion while we transition. Um, yeah, changes in air, ocean currents or air circulation. This is a huge issue and very complicated. Um, but we do know that, for example, we talked about polar amplification. As the pole gets warmer, the difference between the temperatures in the pole and the equator is smaller. And that has a lot of effects in air circulation, including leaking the jet stream. And there's some speculation, still a lot of discussions, very controversial, that those shifts in the jet stream are in part, for example, the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest. We've got high pressure off the, uh, the coast of Oregon and Washington uh, that's keeping the jet stream farther to the north. That may be, may be in part related to leaking. So, who knows? Um, let's see. Are we headed for a Pliocene hot era? Um, the uh, there's uh, there are different. Uh, there, um, there's the the Pliocene was earlier. There is also a Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum. So I'm not sure which one you're talking about. But basically, yeah, how hot are we compared to temperatures in the past? If we go into the very deep past, temperatures were probably. 10, 15 degrees Celsius warmer than we are now. We're probably not going that far. It looks like we're heading for three, four, five degrees Celsius. Three would be bad, five would be disastrous. Not because it would wipe out all life on Earth. Uh, when we talk about uninhabitable planet, that's not really what we're, what we, what's the science is saying. But the science is saying we're looking at temperatures that have not, we have not seen since human beings have been on Earth. We've built all of our infrastructure, our cities, our ports, our water systems, all based on the climate that's been relatively stable for the last 12,000 years. And there's a huge disruption from that, even if we don't get to those really super high temperatures that we had tens of millions of years ago. Okay. Um, and then I'm looking at um, science of CHA methane now doesn't increased water vapor fuel storm. Yeah, um, it is uh, basically when we talk about uh, water vapor, water vapor is the, where there, water is a greenhouse gas. So water has a lot, water is a huge impact on the climate. The fact that we have a planet where we have both liquid and gaseous and solid water, all three phases existing is a huge factor in all of our climate systems and it makes us really unique. Uh, the water vapor is controlled mainly by the other greenhouse gases because water vapor just depends on temperature. We've got huge supplies of water. 70% of the ocean surface is covered by water. So if the temperature goes up, the amount of uh, moisture that the atmosphere can hold goes up and we get more water vapor in the atmosphere. That's a feedback so that the actual warming we get about half of it is due to the greenhouse gases we put in, and about half of it is due to the water vapor increasing in response. 
So water vapor amplifies the greenhouse effect. Movement of water vapor also has huge effects on uh, water. And of course, more water means more storms. And uh, we, uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about at all today is the, uh, the water cycle. But warmer world, we kick up both evaporation and precipitation. So we're seeing huge drought in the West, which is dry already, amping up the temperatures, increases evaporation. We're seeing downpours, increases in precipitation in the Eastern US and other parts of the world. And this is again, one of the projections from the models, which is now we're now seeing borne out, is that when you get increased temperatures, you get more extremes. And when precipitation falls, it falls in smaller, shorter, and much more intense uh, in, uh, events so that we get this kind of flooding that we've seen, especially in the Southeastern US over the last couple of years. Um, how to find knowledgeable people on AC? That's that's a really good question. I, I, I was lucky, I found uh, some folks, I live up in San Clemente, so uh, I happen to find a, a group, but I would definitely look for uh, folks that specialize in doing mini splits. That's, it's not for everybody. Uh, you want to look at the pros and cons uh, relative to traditional air conditioning. Uh, and if you're, it's also, you don't necessarily want to go out and junk your system if it's still working, because there's also embedded carbon in all the equipment. So it may be better to run it. Be sure you're keeping it tuned up, though. Be sure there's no leaks in your system, because then those coolants are leaking out into the atmosphere. So you do want to keep a, a handle on those leaks. When you do, in some ways, I would have liked to have held off a little bit more because I'd love to get mini, a mini split that uses a non-HFC coolant, that uses a coolant that's not going to be so damaging. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to retrofit mine. So uh, yeah, I would start, I would look for folks who know about mini splits, who maybe say something about minimizing leaks and HFCs. Um, and also, uh, Joy just said, uh, check out San Diego Building Electrification website. So uh, I have not seen that, but that looks like that might be a good resource. So yeah, I would definitely do that. Um, yeah, white roof is uh, great. Uh, this is uh, something that um, kind of the Rosenfeld, I think, was the name of the guy who uh, really started this cool roofs movement, uh, painting surfaces white. And in some cities, you can actually see if you go to Google Earth, you can look at the history of satellite images and you can see some places where you start to see more and more white roofs. They, um, the, part of the, uh, the benefit is that the building is, you basically need less AC. It's a way to make, a cheap way to make the building more energy efficient. It also, because it reduces use of AC, then you're not using as much energy, you're not emitting as much greenhouse gas. So it's great. I wish I could do that. And for, I live in a small historic mission revival house with a red tile roof and by the city code, I have to preserve that. It's a historic house. Although they are now developing coatings that will reflect infrared so it doesn't heat up as much. So it may not look white, but it's actually white in, uh, in infrared. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of things we can do individually. Um, but uh, you know, we also need to, I, as this group is doing, communicating, talking to other folks, because it's really getting that widespread con concern and a level of concern where you, you can't have half of the Senate completely just like doing nothing about climate change. Uh, you know, that in the 21st century, it shouldn't be possible for an official to stay in office if they don't have a plan to deal with climate change. We're not there yet, but I think we're moving in that direction. Okay, so that was a long. All right, well, it looks like we got all the questions and we're uh, at our hour limit. So just perfect timing on that. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much. You could tell you are a really great professor or were a really great professor before you retired uh, because you took a very complicated topic with graphs and charts and really made it easy to understand. And uh, and your visuals and videos were very beneficial. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time. And unless there's any final burning questions, uh, we'll go ahead and looks like, yeah. Yeah, love the charts. We got a lot of really good comments. So once again, Jonathan, thank you so much. We thank really you. appreciate it.
Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, very good. All right. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next month.